Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Peter Robinson and this is the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. So today, Wei Zhe Zhang is going to tell us all about different types of NFTs and what they mean from a cross-chain perspective. So Wei Zhe, before you share your slides, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Peter. It's great to be invited to this uh, engineering uh, meetup. Uh, it's, I feel very comfortable with talking to, to your team, uh, your meetup uh, members. Uh, uh, I am uh, the VP of engineering for uh, OneChain. It's a startup company working on uh, coaching operations. And also I teach at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, smart contract development course. So I've been doing a smart contract uh, technology for, for a long time. And today's topic is about the cross-chain transfer of uh, NFT, non-fungible tokens. So I'm going to uh, share my screen very soon. And because this is a small group, I welcome you to ask questions if you have any, and then we, we can answer uh, uh, questions as, as, as much as I can. There's still some problems we need to solve, but I'll try my best to answer all your questions. Yeah, so should we uh, share screen, Peter? Yes, yes, please. Sounds great. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the topic is a quad-chain uh, quad uh, asset transfer for uh, lamp fungible tokens, NFT, and I'm um, from one chain. Um, Yeah, the content for my talk, uh, there are six of them, uh, six topics. First is about uh, NFT, uh, basically an introduction of NFT. And then the, I'm going to talk about uh, why NFT cross-chain. And then I'm going to talk about cross-chain technologies. And Peter and I are working together on the uh, cross-chain interoperability work group uh, for EA Enterprise Decision and Nice. And we are familiar with these technology, but some of you may not be familiar with these technologies. So I'm going to go through them as well. And I'm going to uh, go to NFT cross-chain considerations, what kind of factors we need to consider for NFT cross-chain and what's the differences between uh, NFT and the FT cross-chains. And then we're going to, going to give an example of an NFT cross-chain example. And then we are going to discuss the uh, mechanism and challenges for NFT asset transfer. Yeah, if you have any question, please uh, uh, just uh, raise your hand uh, uh, through Zoom or just uh, send a question, uh, a chat to me directly. Yeah, first about uh, NFT. Uh, NFT uh, different from FT uh, uh, in that it's uh, distinguishable asset that can be used to represent ownership. Uh, so uh, for NFT, it can represent physical assets such as the houses, cars, or artwork. And normally for this artwork, it will be single copy. And then you could also represent uh, virtual collections, uh, collectible such as digital art or collectible cards. And these collectible cards can have multiple copies, but with different serial number. And then you call, can also represent uh, certificates such as birth certificate or diplomas. And these are different, uh, these are kind of different from each other because uh, for certificates, they are not transferable because uh, some of the uh, NFTs are transferable and some of them are not. Uh, and certificates belong to uh, NFTs that cannot be transferred. And then the uh, negative value asset, uh, some of the assets, loans, debt, uh, burdens, and other responsibilities that have a negative value. Yeah, and then the, uh, for Ethereum world, the NFT specification is uh, this ERC721, uh, this which is different from ERC20, uh, which is a fungible token. And then the key feature uh, of uh, this ERC721 is uh, it's a field called ID, and this provides uniqueness for each token. Uh, and then the uh, NFT uh, token can be minted with a unique owner uh, so that uh, each unique token is owned by a unique owner. And then the NFT token can be transferred normally, uh, except for the certificates, et cetera. Yeah, and some people may think that NFT is, is very complex, uh, but actually it's not. Once the uh, ERC-721 spec came out, there are several projects that actually uh, do the implementation for the, for the spec. 
so there's a GeoX uh, spec and there is a, a open Zeppelin spec. And I think consensus also uh, has an implementation. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not spec, it's implementation for, for the spec. So what you need to do to mint, to create a smart contract for NFT, what you need to do is just to import that uh, um, uh, solidity file that have been implemented by other projects, and then just uh, create a smart contract that extend the ERC721 class. And here I use a TTC a diploma uh, smart contract. TTC stands for Texas Te Technology College. That does not exist yet. I uh, just want to mint a diploma for that. Uh, so you provide a, a field, a private field called token IDs. And then there's an admin. Admin is the administrator who manage this uh, smart contract. So in the constructor, you just have one line saying that I mean equal to the message center, which means that when you deploy the, the smart contract, whoever deploys the smart contract will become the administrator of this, uh, this uh, NFT smart contract. And then there's a function called issue diploma, and then you can issue a, 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 a diploma with a unique token URI, unique resource identifier to a student address. So once it, you uh, issue that, that call that function, you basically assign the uh, diploma ID and then you mint that ID to the student's address and then you set the URI address to that diploma. And that URI address could be a database uh, URI address provided by university. And then you just return that uh, diploma ID. So with this, just about 10 lines of code, uh, less, than 15, 10 lines, uh, less than 15 lines of code, you can create a smart contract of NFT and deploy to Ethereum blockchain or to any EVM uh, compatible, compatible blockchain uh, to issue a diploma. And most of the uh, NFT tokens are, are fairly simple. So it can be just written uh, with very easy, uh, easy coding. And of course, like CryptoKitty is a little bit more complex and we can discuss it later. That has impact on, on core chain as well. Yeah, a any question? I saw two chats coming in. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah greetings. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go uh, forward. Um, yeah, so a characteristic of NFT core chain. We saw the sample code, we know how to write the uh, NFT smart contract code, and there are some several characteristics. First one is that uh, uh, each NFT token has an index that is unique. So you need to make sure there's no collision for the index when you assign, create a, a new index for, for a, a token. And then each NFT token has an owner, and this owner can, can of course transfer a little bit. And then also NFT can point to a physical or virtual asset outside the blockchain. And this is very important because um, each file, each uh, asset uh, physically can be represented as an as a NFT token. But the blockchain itself has a, a cost for storage. And therefore, normally, the, the, the true storage of that asset is outside the, the blockchain itself. Uh, it could be a database, it could be an a IPFS, right? but it's outside the Ethereum blockchain to save the cost. Yeah, so there, there is a URI that's pointing to an outside resource. And then each NFT token can be transferred from one owner to another uh, with the function of transfer form. And this is uh, similar to ERC20 token. And then, of course, this is, a, this is a payable function. And then there are other functions such as events and interfaces that help NFT token to be assigned, transferred, or identified. So these are the main characteristics of uh, NFT tokens. And there are the, the DApps, the central applications for NFT normally are the tools and libraries. Uh, GeoXert, Open Zeppelin provide uh, NFT uh, uh, implementation, uh, the consensus also. And then there are communities such as CryptoKitty, uh, CryptoPunk, OpenZoo, et cetera. And then there are marketplaces for OpenSea or Decentraland. Right? So, so I think the bigger market of uh, NFT is mainly uh, the marketplace, right? Everybody can mint NFT. Uh, everybody can, can do their own NFT, but what makes the NFT MT useful are the marketplaces that, that people exchange uh, NFTs. 
Yeah, and there are some limitations when NFTs are confined in one blockchain. Uh, uh, so the first thing is that, well, when the, there are some limitations right now for these applications. Uh, first thing is that NFT is confined to blockchain where it is created. Right? Uh, and, and when it is created, it's just confined to a particular blockchain. Like CryptoKitty is on Ethereum blockchain. And for physical asset, uh, the, when you have a physical asset, the, uh, the token can be created um, in different blockchains really, right? And, and which blockchain should we create? And once we create the NFT of a physical asset on one blockchain, can we use that physical, uh, that token asset on other blockchains, right? Without cross-chain, this is not possible. So there's a lack of cross-chain applications of NFT because NFT application had to be bound by the with a particular blockchain. Yeah, so uh, why NFT cross-chain? Right? So it's obvious that uh, uh, we want NFT asset to be able to be cross-chain transferred to other blockchains for trading, right? If you mint a, a NFT in Cardano, you may want to trade that NFT asset on OpenSea in Ethereum. Like, can we uh, transfer asset from one blockchain to another and trade it in other blockchains? And second thing is that we want to save transaction fees and improve scalability. Right? In this case, you can uh, transfer an NFT from Ethereum to a layer two or to a, another EVM compatible blockchain and you can uh, 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 trade with, in other blockchains and then and then redeem back to the original blockchain. And then there are some NFT specific applications that can work with different blockchains. And basically we want NFT to be mint once and then use anywhere in any blockchain. So that'd be, that'd be cool. You just need to mint the NFT as unique token in one blockchain, but the NFT can be used in any blockchain. Yeah. Now we go to this uh, core chain. Uh, uh, Peter and I are very familiar, familiar with core chain, but some of you may not be familiar. So I'm going to go some of the basic. So what is core chain? Well, when we say core chain, we mean it's protocols, frameworks, or platforms to facilitate or facilitate the transfer of assets, messages, data, and commands among uh, blockchains. Um, yeah, this is a picture that shows that. Uh, and on that hand side, you have some uh, tokens in some blockchains. And on the right hand side, you can transfer those tokens through bridges to another blockchain. So this is the, uh, the asset transfer. And then once you transfer uh, tokens from one source chain to a target chain, you can use the uh, DeFi applications on the target chain and through the through the core chain operations. So this is an asset transfer. And then you can, you can go beyond asset transfer to that these uh, token to be uh, data or messages. And that, that way you can transfer data uh, from one chain to another one. And then the challenge is that how do you transfer a command? Uh, this is something that Peter has been working on with GPAC. So uh, core chain uh, transfer mechanisms, right? We talk about asset can be transferred from a source chain to a target chain. And there are different mechanisms to, for doing that. The first, first one is what we call LMBU, is lock and mint, burn and unlock. And this is, this is very common now. And three years ago, this is brand new, cutting edge. But now it's like every, every bridge can provide this functionality. So what it does is that uh, when you want to do a transfer of assets from a source chain to a target chain, you basically send a transaction in the source chain to the source chain, and you lock the source chain, lock the asset on the source chain. And then you... Uh, uh, transfer uh, through the bridge node and the, the event uh, is transferred, is detected in the bridge and then, and then, and then uh, another transaction will be uh, initiated on the target chain to mint the same amount of token on the, on the target chain. So it lock, you basically lock the asset on the source chain and mint the same value of uh, asset on the target chain. And then when you want to redeem it, just uh, burn the asset on the target chain and emit an event, and then the bridge detect the event, and then send the transaction uh, onto the uh, uh, source chain to redeem, to unlock, unlock the asset and basically redeem the asset back to the original owner. So this is the lock, mint, and the burn, and unlock. And this is very common technology now. 
And then the second one is a cross-chain access swap. Basically, you have two access port on the source chain and the target chain. And when you want to do the access transfer, you just swap on the source chain. And then once that swap event is detected, you do another swap on the target chain. And this way, you do not need to uh, kind of uh, have a wrap token. It's a native uh, token transfer or swap on both chains. And then the third one is, uh, is really cutting edge, uh, which is uh, Peter has been working on, uh, is direct uh, core chain function calls. So basically you deploy the smart contract on the source chain and deploy the smart contract on the target chain. And then you execute a uh, function call uh, through this core chain mechanism. So you can call a function on the target chain directly from a function in the source chain. And that requires a lot of security considerations and also performance considerations as well. Uh, and also a lot of specification need to be done to make this kind of a cross chain function call to be uh, uh, to be common and can be implemented through some standard procedures. Yeah, and also talk about the cross chain uh, uh, bridges topology. So today we can do the uh, L1 to L1 uh, bridging, and this is kind of a from uh, Ethereum to Cardano to Polkadot uh, to Bitcoin to one chain. Uh, so this is a layer one to layer one. And then bridge can be a uh, layer one to layer two. And this is kind of a, you have optimistic uh, uh, layer two uh, and then talk to the layer one. And then the bridge can be L2 to L2 as well. So basically you have two L2s and then you need to transfer asset uh, among them. Uh, and then you can do L2 to L2 uh, as well. So these, uh, there are different kinds of bridges built on, on these already for these different kinds of topology. Yeah, and then this is a, this, this is a picture showing the, uh, the components, right? You have a, a three blockchains, A, B, and C, and then you can have a different enterprises that provide a relay node uh, to connect different blockchains. And then when you detect event on a source chain, you can, you can, uh, you can construct a transaction for the target chain and then and then send that or send a message to the target chain and then that did uh, operate on the on the target chain and this picture actually came from peter yeah and then they're talking about the uh nft cross chain consideration right uh, uh, uh for erc20 the fungible token uh, transfer is very easy it's a one-time thing you uh, the user come to the the application and specify the token uh he or she want to transfer from a source chain uh, to a target chain and then and then specify a target address and then and, and, and initi initiate the transaction and once the transaction is finished it's, it's done but for nft uh, uh, it's, it's kind of more complex because it there are several things you need to consider here one is that uh, is the nft core chain an asset transfer or data transfer and I think it's both, right? Because NS, NFT has value. So it's, it's to some extent, it's an asset transfer. But NFT also has data, metadata. And therefore, it's, it's, it's also a data transfer. And with that, it, it brings, brings uh, complexity as well. Uh, so uh, other consideration is that the NFT question need to maintain uniqueness, right? Because once, suppose you, um, you transfer a token uh, from a source chain to, to, to the target chain, right? And you, you basically have to have two, uh, to, two NFT tokens on two chains already. And we'll let the one on the target chain point to the same asset that's physically outside the blockchain. So you need to consider that as well. And then you also consider the interop uh, uh, because if you have an application that deal with OpenSea uh, uh, token uh, in the Ethereum blockchain, can, if that token get transferred to uh, Cardano, can your application still work with, with, can your application still work with a token on the Cardano blockchain? So those, those kind of inter, interop cross, cross, uh, questions. And then also cross much multiple blockchains. Can you transfer a token from one chain A to chain B and then to chain C? And how do you maintain the ownership and the uniqueness over there? Yeah, and then also the tradability of the uh, uh, of token like certificates. Okay, how can you um, uh, 
transfer a certificate from one, one chain to another one and, 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 and prevent it from, from trading to transferring the own ownership. Yeah, and also security. Um, uh, security is a big thing here because uh, the, the price of uh, NFT is subjective. Uh, somebody may mint a, a token with a huge value and then, and then transfer that to another uh, blockchain and then put the burden on the bridge because the bridge need to secure that value of an NFT token. And then a hacker may trace the original token on the source chain. And in that case, there is a, there is a kind of a collateration of staking for the bridges because the, the staking for the bridge cannot guarantee that amount of a, a NFT token price. And then there's a, Another thing is the update of NF NFT data on the source chain, because uh, uh, when NFT is minted, there, there are some metadata on the source chain. And this metadata may be transferred to the target chain. However, the metadata on the source chain can be modified by the smart contract function call. And in that case, how can we update the one on the target chain? Then there's an issue of that. There may be inconsistency with the data. And then also there's a core chain uh, transaction fees need to be considered as well. Yeah. So and here I give an example uh, that one chain implemented uh, for core chain uh, uh, NFT. Uh, so this is the, the GUI. Basically, uh, you uh, in this uh, GUI you can specify what kind of asset NFT asset you want to have, and then you select uh, the source chain. You, you want uh, this uh, uh, token to be transferred from, and then you specify a, a target uh, blockchain, and then basically you specify a recipient address, and then you just connect, uh, connect next. And then, it, then the uh, transaction will be uh, sent to the uh, managing uh, blockchain, and then there will be uh, another uh, NFT token we maintain on the target chain. So, yeah, and this shows the, the details of it and it's a success. And this is transferring from uh, this address to this address and from Moonbeam Alpha to Ethereum blockchain. Yeah, and then this one, uh, one chain has a record of uh, this quadchain and the NFT transaction as well. Yeah, so the process is, uh, is very simple. It's just like uh, from NFT quadchain bridge, user connect uh, wallet uh, through MetaMask and then uh, choose the NFT tra to transfer, specify the source chain and target chain and specify the target address. And then use the send, user sends the transfer request. And then uh, the NFT asset will be locked by the smart contract on the source chain. And then the, then the, the source chain will emit the event. And then the core chain bridge detect the lock event. And once that lock event is com confirmed, the NFT asset will be maintained on the target chain. So this is the binting process. And then to redeem is very similar. It's just uh, unlock. Uh, they just uh, burn the, the token on the target chain and then you unlock the one on the source chain, just the reverse process. Yeah, so there are uh, uh, some uh, challenges and, and, and solutions uh, just uh, these, I throw this out because there's no uh, perfect solution yet. Uh, so just for future discussion as well. First, the staking and slashing for NFT bridges, right? Because uh, in order to secure a uh, quadchain bridge, we need to let the bridge node to stake some asset to pre prevent the uh, collusions, right? Because our bridges are all open. Anybody can be a bridge provider, but if they, they can do something wrong, steal uh, the asset, uh, so we let them stake uh, some asset to prevent them from, from doing something wrong. However, the NFT price is uh, subjective. And in this case, how can we uh, stake properly for the bridges? And then there's challenge over there. And then there's um, token URI transfer. Uh, this is a challenge because the uh, token URI can be modified on the source chain, right? Once it's modified on the source chain, how can this get synchronized on the target chain? Do we need to have a robot for that? And that's a challenge. So it's go beyond the user transaction because for fungible token, ERC20 token, uh, only user need to initiate the, the transfer. However, for NFT, you still need 
some robot probably need some robot to maintain the consistency or synchronization of the data on the source chain and the target chain. Maybe some speci new specification can be done to solve this problem. And then there's a challenge of third party apps for cross-chain NFT. I mentioned this earlier, like how can you make OpenSea application work both for Ethereum blockchain and the Cardano blockchain or Polkadot blockchain. Yeah, and also what if the NFT smart contract is updated on the source chain? Do we need to reflect that on the target chain as well? Yeah, so it's, and also NFT core chain is more than data transfer. It involves ownership and also involves the, uh, the asset and also the data itself. And also primitive or complex NFT, NFT tokens. Sometimes NFT tokens may be related. It's not a primitive type where you can uh, make it stand alone and transfer, lock it in the source chain and then, and then, and then mint it on the, on the target chain. For example, like CryptoKitty, you have parent crypto kitty and you have children crypto kitty if you want to transfer the child kitty to the target chain what will happen to the parent kitty on the on the source chain so these are more complex nft tokens and then uh, to make question work for this kind of nft it requires some more considerations for for interoperability yeah and then also the security considerations how can we provide a secure bridge for that can we use a mpc multi-sign etc for the chain transfer and then also question for heterogeneous blockchain what if the smart contract are totally different a smart nft smart contract for cardano is totally different from the one in evm how can we chain these two type of uh, nft tokens and then data storage and synchronizations. Uh, how can we store data in external sources and synchronize some of the these data? Yeah, these are the are the things that I think are important for NFT core chain. And I think maybe some a new specification to deal with uh, NFT core chain would be very very useful. Yeah, that's uh, is it possible for common specification for core chain NFTs? So I I I. I present this out as a as a question, maybe also for Peter. Yeah, I think uh, thank you. I want to take questions from here. So, Wager, what should a cross chain NFT? ERC have in it. So what, what should, what, what extra capabilities should? Yeah, uh, great question. I think we need to write the question NFT. Uh, first, you need to have an identifier of a uh, question identity, right? You need to say that this N NFT is residing in this blockchain. So there should be a uh, blockchain uh, attribute over there. And second thing is that there should be some specification of on URI, like the unique resource resource identifier, because that resource identifier could point to some, some databases. And these databases are handled by applications. And these applications have connectivity to different blockchains. And they may be connected to Ethereum blockchain, but may not be connected to to other blockchains. So they need to be, URI need to be kind of more uh, uh, defined in more detail. So they specify the blockchain capability as well. And, and third thing is that we need to define the data synchronization. Okay, if a smart contract, NFT smart contract is uh, updated or the metadata is updated, there should be events emitted so that the core chain application can handle that. Otherwise, the one on the target chain will not know that this thing have been, have been updated on, on the source chain. So there should be some event that if they are defined on the core chain NFT for that. Yeah, and also there are other things like price, right? The, the price is so subjective. If the price can go from $1 to a million dollar, then that, that, that put burden on the bridge itself. Uh, so I still do not know there's a good solution for that, especially today's market is so it's fluctuates so much, right? And and in that case, the, the bridge cannot guarantee the price, right? So 
That is a question I, I do not know how to do in the, in the spec. That go beyond the technical side of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a, as, as far as staking in staking based on the value of the assets for ERC, yeah, ERC 721s. And for that matter, even if you have an NFT, say that represented um, the ownership of a piece of land, yeah. Um, what is the really the value of that NFT? You know, if if somehow rather the NFT is stolen, does that mean that the block of land is stolen, or you know, what is that actually? Yeah. So I guess it depends on what the NFT represents. So if it's just a digital artwork, it maybe it's different to a physical asset, but it's hard, you know, because someone has actual real possession of that. Um, physical asset. Yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, that, that you brought up a great, great point. So the NFT need to have a type as well. So in the middle we have, we define four types, right? <laughs> the, the, the one type is going to the physical asset. In that case, whether NFT is stolen or not, it, it doesn't matter because the physical asset is still there, such as land is still there. And then there's a mapping between the NFT and the physical asset. As long as that mapping is not damaged, right? That the, then the asset is still there. The NFT could be uh, kind of rollback if, if it gets stolen. Right? And then there's another one, which is the digital art. If in digital art case, right, if it's stolen, it's stolen because there's no physical uh, asset to be associated with it. Yeah, and then for yeah. certificate, yeah, certificate is another thing is even more interesting. If somebody steal it, <laughs> then it still doesn't help, right? Because the, the record is still in the college database, yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I mean, what does, it, what does it mean to say if the NFT is, is I mean, would say, say if I had a, I don't know, some college degree and it was represented by an NFT, is it, yeah, it, it, surely they're non-transferable. Like I can't be, I can't earn a um, PhD in, you know, engineering at a university and I can't transfer that qualification. So I guess in that case, stealing it doesn't make sense because transferring it doesn't make sense either. Yeah, um, yeah. That yeah. one is to sh more to show the credential, right? It's, it's to, for someone, and then you just need to show that you have this degree, that that's basically it. So there's no meaning for transferring or trading it, yeah. Mm. Yeah, but uh, I mean, say if we started, say, issuing NFTs for people who turn up to the meetup group, I mean, I guess if we then said later on, we were going to issue a T-shirt to whoever's got a hundred of the yeah. NFT tokens showing that they um, had been to a hundred meetups or something. I, I guess then suddenly we've, we're giving value to stealing the NFT. So even though trying to say, I've got an NFT to say I've turned up to a meetup group is meaningless. I guess if suddenly, if you had a hundred of them, it had value, then that would be different. Yeah, yeah. I've got a question for the audience. Um, is anyone using NFTs or has anyone issued an NFT for anything that's on this talk at the moment? Well, I issued um, the NFT uh, for the uh, drawing created by my wife. <laughs> Listed on a Z, but um, still there. Nobody's buying that. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's no good. I, I sometimes think that, you know, my, 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 my daughter's a fantastic artist, actually. So that they'd probably sell it for a million dollars, but I wouldn't sell it. Um, but yeah, that's so, all right. Well, so we've got a digital art um, one. There you go. Yeah, actually, I once, uh, yeah, I have kids drawing and I think those are valuable. I definitely, uh, what I'm thinking is that you have young kids have different kinds of cartoons and different kind of drawing, and you can mint those uh, in, in one blockchain, uh, definitely, right? But it's very expensive to mint it on Ethereum blockchain. So the way I see question is that you can, you can build a, a very cheap uh, EVM compatible blockchain, and that kid's drawing uh, to be minted as NFT token for that, 
And if they are good ones, then you, you, you move it to Ethereum to trade over there. Yeah, well, I, I, and I know we've, um, Angela and I have talked about how you can have, say, an NFT, which is an in-game character, and then all of their tools and equipment and things that they accrue are NFTs on one of the side chains. And so in that way, when you do, when you sell the character, you want to sell obviously all the gear they've got. And so you need to be able to do atomically the sale of the NFTs on the side chain and the NFT on the main chain. But then, yeah, so, so obviously that's a cross chain thing, but then issuing that NFT, assuming you're it's a hundred dollars or $200 transaction fee, then that's going to be a really expensive in-game character. Yeah. You have to be very keen to play the game. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and and that's why one reason we need to have cross-chain operation, right? It should be done in the less expensive blockchain, <laughs> not in Ethereum. Uh, yeah, well, in, well, in the main chain, yeah. Well, and I think that's the thing. I think roll-ups when they um, happen, which are, I think they're in the midst of happening, and when they're part of rolled up into the data chains, that data shards for Ethereum two or Ethereum, the future of Ethereum, when all that happens, I think suddenly the cost of using Ethereum will be cheap again, back like it was in 2016. And so at that point, I think then all these side chains will probably have to decrease their fees by an order of magnitude to still be relevant. And so then we'll be in a different era of um, Ethereum blockchain ecosystem. Um, yeah. All right, Cliff has got a question. Yes, Peter. Uh, thanks for organizing that this is fun. And uh, thanks for your kindly sharing. So I assumed uh, this is a bit early in China. So good morning. Yeah, actually, good afternoon. I'm in Texas, actually. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> good afternoon. Yeah. yeah. So I got I got two questions for you. Uh, yeah. The first one was I'm not so sure if I was missed. So um, the unique ID representing NFT on source chain, uh, yeah. how would it be uh, reflected or referenced? Uh, across this uh, transfers from one chain to another and from one chain to another? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. That's what we say the uniqueness of a of token, right? So uh, I'm thinking the two things. One is that you have that unique ID, which is unique uh, uh, on, on a source chain. And if that ID is, uh, is transferred to a target chain, it's, it is still unique because the one on the source chain has been locked already. So then the uniqueness get transferred to the to the target chain. Uh, but I'm thinking uh, one more thing, maybe we need to say that add a blockchain ID as well. So it become ID plus blockchain ID. So this one will guarantee that that ID represent a blockchain and also a token ID. So it's, it's unique both in blockchain and inside the blockchain. So, so there are two things, one is direct transfer but that still have, that has a potential for collision. Another one is transfer and then add the blockchain ID to the original ID. Okay, I see. Uh, the, another question I have uh, is that the, uh, the history of the transfer. As the, uh, the, the new minted NFT in the target chain, uh, does it also uh, has the uh, history of transfer, which can be easily, uh, you know, uh, used uh, by by the user to tracking the NFTs. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, no, I, I do not think so. It just get the it, the latest state gets transferred to the target chain. The history you have to go back to the original chain to to trace the to to trace the the history. Yeah, and that's what we say. The cross chain operation, the application need to kind of watch different blockchains and then have the full history. Uh, so you're going to have a token that traded three times in the source chain and then got transferred to a target chain and then transferred several times over there. The whole history should be, should be done by a cross-chain uh, application. So you have to need to watch several blockchains. Got it, got it. Thank you. Yeah. So I'd like to drill in on one of the things you said there. So you said maybe you could have a blockchain ID 
and in NFT ID. So say if the NFT points to well, Cliff's wife's artwork. And so, you know, it represents that asset, that, that artwork. Even if you've moved it from one chain to a different chain, it still represents that artwork. So shouldn't it, it doesn't it still have, you know, does it make sense to have a different ID on different chains? Like even if it's the same ID, but with the blockchain information, does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, Peter, I, when I say that, I, I, I had the consideration of prim primitive token and the complex token. Remember, remember in the presentation, I said, if they are simple NFT token, Yes, there's a unique identifier, then you move it anywhere, it doesn't matter. But what if it's a complex uh, uh, NFT token, such as Crypto Kitty, you have a, a child kitties and parent kitties, and you move some of the siblings to a different blockchain, and then you need to mark the, 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 the chain so that you know where it resides. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. That does make sense. Yeah, because uh, otherwise the application, you need to know where to pull these things down. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and so if an application, say, is looking at chain A and B, and you've got yeah. NFT contracts that represent the NFTs that that application has, and so someone has a, um, a, a marketplace on chain C, and so you move it out of the purvoy of the application, so to this marketplace. Um, and, and, and I guess what you could do a sale in that market, a transfer and things. But beyond transfers, you can't really do much outside the per, outside the application, I guess. Now I'm just trying trying to think through exactly how this is going to work and whether there's any limitations or whether you'd be better off having it only doing a marketplace on a chain that the application knows about. Do, do you have thoughts on that or does it matter? Or? Yeah, um, yeah, I think this depends on the design of the application, right? Um, and, and sometimes if, uh, um, See when when we when you have an application, right? You you need to know the URI and you need to have Web3 to connect to that particular blockchain. Right. And then if once you do the cross chain, the application needs to be changed. For example, the OpenSea today only connect to Ethereum, right? And if you want to trade it in uh, in the Cardano, you need to that OpenSea to talk to Cardano as well. And that's additional work on that already. Right, so transfer to which blockchain depends on the uh, capacity of the application. Yeah, and that's why I would mention about the cross chain application need to change as well. It need to be multi chain as well. Uh, sure, thank you. Yeah, are I think, there, uh, yeah, yeah. Are there any other questions? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was thinking that you brought up a very good point, the cross-chain NFT specification. We need to think about that in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll, I'll have it as one of the mini balls in the air. Um, <laughs> um, look, I'll make a mean? comment. So, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, I definitely vote for the, the Meetup NFT. Uh, I keep thinking it would be really fun to have a go at making one and experimenting. Um, but yeah, a meetup NFT with, would be really great. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we got to the point of um, almost of starting to learn about how to do the, the, um, the Decentraland Beanie NFT. Um, and for those people who are trying to decode what that actually means. So in Decentraland is one of those um, metaverse things where you can walk around and you can have wearables and they're represented by NFT. So in other words, you have to have that NFT associated with your Ethereum address to be able to have the NFT. And so Joanne and I looked at, so how do you actually create a beanie in Decentraland and there's a whole tutorials and the whole like I'm sure with one week 
Joanne, or probably Joanna, do it in a day. But anyway, so with, with uh, not that much effort, but more effort than, oh, no, hey, she got it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with some level of effort, we could do it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I do uh, like NFTs that have purpose. I thought it was really cool how we got the consensus hoodie um, that we can actually wear in decentral land. So. Um, but yeah, the, the sort of the different properties of NFT is quite interesting. And then how you think about, um, you know, representing ownership or transferring. I think there's some really interesting questions. So it was great to hear the presentation. Yeah. 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 And so if anyone is a budding um, artist, go and do the Google search, or you can even fire Joanne and I a message and we can send you the tutorial links and if you can create the um, the, the the beanie NF um, the beanie graphic -y thing that works in decentral land, I think um, we can work out a way of getting the hundred dollars or whatever is needed to start issuing the NFTs that represent the beanie. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, okay. Why don't I share the slides for next week because. Since, um, yeah, in the time, the yeah, holiday project, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that'll be, that'll go down well with my, my wife. Um, you know, don't worry, I'm just going to spend the next week trying to get some 3D graphics working. Um, yeah. All right, just a sec. And there we go. And I'll go click and there uh, yeah because i since i i shared the end slides with you wager i also added in um an extra talk so i will so those are the social information for the meetup and forthcoming talks um, 13th of July, Vanessa from um, Consensus R&D is going to talk about MEV in Ethereum 2. And then um, we've got um, Ermias talking about atomicity of um, cross-chain transactions and his thoughts on what atomicity actually means. And then in just under two weeks after that, I'm going to um, bite the bullet and do that smart contract security talk. And um, yeah, that should be interesting. Um, I've got a few ideas on what I'm gonna say, but um, I'm sure all sorts of people have got great ideas on what smart contract security actually means and what you could actually do. So if you please fire through your thoughts. Uh, oh, holiday, pro holiday project for you. Oh, cool. That's even better, Joanne. <laughs> or better when someone else is doing it. Um, all right, well, look, um, does anyone have any final questions for Wager? All right, well, look, thank you again, Wager. That was a really interesting talk. So thank you for putting that together and delivering it. Um, if anyone asks a question on YouTube, I will um, make sure that I ping you so you get around to answering it. So thank you and yeah. have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye.